Hello and welcome to Unicon's Open Source Support Briefing for Identity and Access Management. I'm Cherie Sarawood, the Senior Director of Unicon's IAM program, and I'll be your facilitator today for the webinar. As you know, Unicon provides open source support for many products. Today we're specifically going to be focusing on the IAM products, which includes CAS, Shibboleth, Grouper, SimpleSimple PHP, and Midpoint. All right, with that said, let's go into the agenda. All right, so for today, this is what we're going to be covering. We're going to start off by going into, if you can, thank you. We're going to go into IAM events and trends, which really pulls some of the highlights from the community and focuses on some conference information. Then we'll go into the products that I've mentioned, Shibla, CAS, Grouper, Simple Simple, PHP, and Midpoint. Within those areas, you're going to hear about some sustaining engineering, which we did on your behalf, and those contributions that went back into the community as well as information on some version updates, possibly security information. Then we're going to finish up with a note on some contributions that were made um, from a few of our other Unicon clients, um, but again, all available to the community uh, for you and others to take advantage of. So with that said, I'm going to introduce you to the team for today. So JJ, or Jonathan Johnson, is going to be talking about the event, events and trends, as well as our grouper update. We're then going to move over to Dima Kopolinko, who will share shibboleth information, followed up by Mike Grady, who will talk about Simple SAML PHP, Paul Spotty will share midpoint updates, and then we'll finish off the application information with Matt Wolfley, and he's going to talk to us about CAS. All right, to get things going, I'm going to kick it off with JJ starting and telling us about events and trends. JJ? Hey, thanks, Sharice. <clears throat> My name is JJ, and as Sharice says, I'm going to be telling you a little bit about IAM, some of the events and trends. Very recently, the EDUCAUSE conference was a, was a success, and going forward, we have several other events that are coming up. A lot of them are tied to the Internet, too. Of uh, particular interest to, I know several of you, is the tech exchange that's coming up. Here in a few weeks, uh, December 9th in New Orleans, uh, followed by the global summit that's going to be happening <clears throat> in the uh, spring. Excuse me. One of the uh, one of the more interesting uh, conferences that's coming up, and I know that, especially for me, being attached to the grouper side, there's this Educause Security Professional Conference. And I know that a group of the grouper developers and grouper users are trying to put together a presentation for that particular conference. And of course, um, the Uncommon Basecamp kind of split out from the Tech Exchange um, is going to be going on next summer. So as you all know, I am, especially in higher education, does not move very quickly. And so a lot of the things that you might see on these slides, you might say, hey, didn't we talk about this last time? Uh, but yeah, they are still entering into the mainstream here. Since our last briefing, the In Common Federation has pushed out their metadata query uh, service encouraging everyone to move over to using that where practical rather than using the full aggregate. If you've ever run into a problem with your IDP crashing on startup because of running out of memory, this is one of the places to start. We're also seeing a lot, a lot of cloud deployments right now gaining a lot um, with the cloud deployments and tied to that are the DevOps attached to that. And so we're seeing a lot more engagements out there with our clients and getting questions out there about, you know, the full DevOps stack, the type of tools that we might use. Do we do things like deploy on on prem or do we go out to the cloud for our deployments? How do we tie all of this stuff together? And another kind of interesting trend and I know that trends kind of um, ebb and flow, 
but there has been a lot of commoditization of web single sign-on. There are a lot of providers out there right now. Users kind of expect web single sign-on and they expect it to work. And just like email a long time ago, folks, folks and very enterprising folks indeed are going out there and starting services to provide web single sign-on as a service. And so you're going to see more talk around that probably in your, your day-to-day -day work. Again, some things here that are probably pretty familiar. These are becoming stronger in particular right now there's a lot of work in open id connect and oauth particularly when we start talking about saml and as a and probably wrong wrongly touted but as a sort of replacement for saml the newer versions of the idp that are going to be coming out are targeting adding that in <clears throat> adding that in as a base feature in their deployment the last two down there are kind of related to each other. There have been there has been some talk out there recently about passwordless authentication and what that looks like. Uh, really tying together a bunch of different types of authentication mechaniz mechanisms and um, technologies that have been around for a while, uh, including things like x509 certificates but tying in as well these new standards that are popping up like web Authn and fido2 if you have not checked it out there was a presentation done by stanford uh in an i oh sorry and i i just blanked there for a moment in the iam the open iam presentation from the internet two a few weeks ago and I believe that I believe that's my next slide, and so I or my last slide. So I'm going to hand this over to Dima to talk to you about Shibboleth. Uh, thank you, JJ, uh, and uh, hello everyone. Um, my name is Dima Kapolenko, and I'll be glad to give you a brief update uh, on the latest developments and releases in uh, Shibboleth world. Um, so basically, since last update there were two patch releases of shibboleth idp and the current production grade release version is 3.4.6 and uh, since last update there were no releases of shibboleth uh, shibboleth sp and the current release remains to be 3.0.4 uh, next slide please and uh, here i'll review the latest releases of uh, shibboleth uh, idp software uh, version uh, 3.4.5 contained uh, minor bug fixes and as well as a security advisory fix, uh, which was uh, related to improper exposure of uh, pairwise identifiers to relying parties. And so the more details on this security advisory could be found uh, in the provided link there. And um, the version 3.4.6 is the latest uh, production grade release, which is uh, also a bug fix release, as well as a security uh, advisory fix uh, related to uh, denial of service uh, by external authentication flows, uh, such as uh, external remote user X509 and Spinego. And uh, the development team uh, provided uh, a bit more uh, details about the uh, implementation of this fix. Uh, they stated that the uh, those flows uh, have been uh, redesigned to fix the denial of service attack uh, via serverless container uh, session attack vector. And uh, basically as part of this redesign, uh, the redesign uh, required API changes to a pair of classes that would uh, ordinarily not be permitted in a patch release, but uh, the direct use of these classes by deployers uh, has been deemed unlikely, they stated, and the existing external login flow deployments remain compatible with this upgrade. And so you could uh, see the provided link there for more details on this uh, security advisor. And um, I also uh, mentioned uh, previously that the uh, 346 is the 
current release and it is recommended release uh, uh, supported version for all shibboleth IDP3 deployments. And last but not least, uh, the shibboleth uh, development team has been hard at work uh, developing version 4.0 of the software. Um, currently, there is not a lot of information available about it, but the developers uh, will be releasing that info and documentation on the wiki about it fairly soon. We could expect that. Um, few things that are definitely known about the version 4, that it will require Java 11 um, at a minimum, and it will be uh, removing currently uh, deprecated uh, features. Um, and uh, so now it would be a, a good time to start uh, preparing for version four uh, by going through logs, uh, examining any warnings related to deprecations and uh, taking care of those. Um, currently, the estimated target release uh, date is not firm, but uh, it's believed to be uh, for version four and it's believed to be uh, sometime early in 2020. Um, and I also want to mention here about a few items to watch for uh, in the future releases of Shibboleth IDP that have been planned but not fully implemented or, or, nor incorporated into core um, IDP software yet. Um, one such item is the OpenID Connect extension developed by Giant Trust and Identity Development Team in Finland. Uh, that would eventually uh, become a part of uh, SHIB IDP core product. Um, and another such item uh, worth uh, mentioning is the uh, planned IDP support for uh, delegated authentication and proxy use cases. Um, next slide, please. Um, and um, as part of uh, open source sustaining engineering work for uh, Shibboleth, uh, here are some of the items that Unicon team has uh, worked on. Uh, first item is uh, version 3.3.0 of uh, SHIP CAS Authent plugin. It's been released and uh, this release uh, concentrated on updating it to work with uh, Shibboleth, latest Shibboleth IDP version 3.4.6 minimum. So um, if you use this plugin, it is recommended to upgrade to this version uh, in conjunction with uh, Shibboleth IDP version uh, 3.4.6. Um, and the next item uh, we've done that's the verification work uh, to check uh, PEC4J library for uh, compliance with the uh, SAML2 deployment profile for uh, federation interoperability. And last but not least, um, uh, you know, work has been done on a Redis storage service plugin to make sure it is well tested and uh, production ready. Um, there is currently still a gap in documentation for this plugin, which uh, will be closed uh, sometime in 2020. And with that, uh, that's all I have today regarding Shibboleth update. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks, Dima. All right, let's welcome Matt. He's gonna to talk to us about CAS. All right, thanks, uh, Sharice, for that introduction. I uh, wanted to kind of take note on this slide that CAS has had a very busy last couple of months um, with the current release uh, being 6.1. Uh, it's very feature packed, so definitely want to check that out. Uh, also, just to uh, take note, the pre-EOL for CAS is uh, version 5.3, effective in October, so um, you'll want to plan your upgrades accordingly around that. And then uh, we have release candidate of 6.2, um, and I'll, I'll be covering that in the next slide, and, uh, and then some sustaining engineering pieces towards the end. All right, so, um, with the uh, announcement of CAS development beginning on CAS 6.2 with 6.1 being released, uh, you might notice some of the features uh, are somewhat recognizable and others are uh, quite new. A few of the more noteworthy changes that we are going to see in CAS 6.2 are going to be around SAML, um, service redirect URLs, and uh, one, one big change 
that I think some customers are going to be happy with is an LDAP health monitoring change, which will allow you to uh, monitor multiple LDAP servers, um, which is kind of nice. Um, this is a full breakdown that can be found on the Via Perio GitHub site. And uh, there is documentation, actually, for some of these features currently available, but you'll want to keep checking back on the development documentation um, as time goes on. And also, um, as usual, just to be aware, there are several uh, library upgrades that are planned, including uh, Gradle, Spring Boot, Spring, Spring Security, and um, several more. Uh, that should bring a lot of functionality and um, bug fixes as well. The uh, other big piece uh, from the last uh, few months is the CAS vulnerability disclosure that was sent out in September. Um, many of you are probably already aware, but uh, this would affect all deployments prior to CAS 5.3.12.1. And in 6, it would be anything before 6.0.5.1 and 6.1, um, depending on which uh, version you're on there. So this, the severity on these, and you can uh, get more information at those CDD numbers, um, but the severity in terms of CAS is somewhat low, considered somewhat low. However, it is, you know, it is a vulnerability regarding the random string utils. And um, so anything that's utilizing that within CAS, which is mostly internal, uh, is going to have some concern for compromisation. Um, so you want to, you know, be sure to, to carry out whatever upgrade uh, is necessary in order to get the security uh, breach patched. And next slide. All right, so uh, in our sustaining engineering efforts, um, we were able to uh, provide some pretty cool contributions. Um, one of them being the geometer load testing that Axel worked pretty hard on um, to give you uh, load testing against several um, uh, several uh, different protocols. Um, and uh, and then the other is the CAS client auto config support that we've been uh, providing through the, the Unicon project has been made available in, official, uh, in the official Java CAS client library starting in version 3.6.0. And uh, I just wanted to give a special thanks to Dima and Axel specifically um, but everybody else for uh, really doing a lot of hard work in this area. And that's it for Cas. All right, thanks, Matt. All right, next we are going to shift over to Grouper and I'm gonna reintroduce JJ. If you all thought you got rid of me, I'm sorry, sorry to break your hearts. I've gotta go back and correct myself on something I said earlier. The passwordless presentation was actually an I am online if you're going back and looking for that. And that was from Stanford last week, as a matter of fact. So we'll move on to Grouper here. The latest version of Grouper is still Grouper 2.4, but if you are still just running stock Grouper 2.4, you are way behind right now. There have been dozens of patches released for it. So go out there and check to see uh, what patches, what bugs you might have, and make sure that you are appropriately patched. There is still a continued march towards a 2.5 release. Uh, <clears throat> hopefully will be released soon. So there are a lot of new, new features and a lot of work happening in those patches in Grouper 2.4. Some of the cooler things that have popped up, there's now some reporting and some visualizations inside of Grouper. The reporting is a little bit rudimentary right now, but they're working on tying in some uh, data graphs and that sort of thing into the stock Grouper user interface so that you could run reports against groups to get information about you know, the groups and the system itself. The visualizations are there right now to help you visualize what your groups look like. And that's especially useful if you have a bunch of indirect, <clears throat> indirect memberships out there. That graph will let you see 
those relationships in those groups. Tied to that, and among other things, were some UI enhancements. They've gone through and cleaned up the UI quite a bit and have added in um, hooks so that you can actually tie into things like reporting and visualization into provisioning as well. Um, and so keep a lookout for those UI enhancements. One feature, uh, one feature that ties back to something that I had mentioned previously, if we're talking about DevOps and containerization and that, that sort of thing, you're always concerned about having a consistent environment out there, particularly in your configuration. One thing that you'll know if you have deployed Grouper is that all of the different pieces in your stack have to have the same configuration in them, regardless if they're just running the UI or if they're running the daemon, for instance. So to help alleviate that, the grouper developers have been exploring moving configuration into the database so that you can actually pull the properties files out of the database rather than you know, including that property everywhere. There is a new syntax out there that you can include in your base configuration and your base properties file. You give it database connection information and it will pull that configuration down. I, I have also heard that that is on the way to also providing a user interface to actually manage that configuration as well. So when you start talking about deploying Grouper out there as a service for your, for your institutions, you have another option so that, or for management of Grouper itself, so that you don't have to go out there and manage on an operating system these files. And of course, there are a lot of bug fixes in these patches. As I mentioned already, if you are running into a bug, make sure you get up to the latest patch of any of the four systems that are covered by the patches. And if that does, if that does not work for you, uh, reach out to either the Grouper community or Unicon. And if we can go to the next slide, Unicon's engagement with the Assisting Engineering for Grouper has, has been directly connected to the community. We have had some bugs reported through us and thank, thank you especially to the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, who helped us track down, develop, actually get <clears throat> some changes out there into the PSPNG uh, to help in that configuration and they helped configure or helped uh, validate that those bugs are actually gone. Uh, beyond that, we have been actively involved in developing the grouper deployment guide. Uh, they are, and I Unfortunately, have not looked recently, but there is work going on on the version two that I believe was supposed to be released pretty soon. I, I'm trying to remember, they are supposed to be having, it was either last week or this week, a grouper uh, meetup. And so I could not remember if that was actually to be released then, but certainly keep a lookout for that deployment guide. There's still a lot of good information out there in the version one, but the version two will have significant updates to it. And I'd like to hand it over, I guess, to Mike now to talk about Simple Simple PHP. Thanks. Hi, this is uh, Mike Grady. And this slide is current as of earlier this morning, but what I will say is that in just over the last week, Simple SAMLs had effectively four releases. So I'm not guaranteeing that the information on this slide is current as of this moment. Um, 
The latest version of Simple SAML PHP is 1.18.1. Uh, there are security issues really with any version before 1.18, although I'll, I'll put a caveat on that. There's fairly significant security issue with any version prior to 1.17.7. Uh, 118 fixes um, a security issue that's much lower where if you've enabled the user interface there's a chance that somebody could uh, could get the PHP info um, you know more information about the server environment that your simple SAML server is running on than you want and for somebody random out in the world to have um, the security issue for versions prior to 117.7 is really impacts any usage of PHP as a service provider, as an SP. Um, noting that that impacts your use of Simple SAML as a proxy also, because it's using its internal SP to communicate to the IDPs that it's um, accepting authentication responses from. The, uh, the flaw being that uh, if you know what you're doing, you can craft an assertion that um, you could claim to be a different user. So it's relatively serious. It is limited though by the fact that you already have to been able to sign into that IDP in the first place. So you have to be an, a user who can authenticate to the IDP from which you are then claiming to be some other user. Uh, but, you know, given the nature of that, you do want to upgrade. Um, whether you want to, the, the difference between one seven, going to 117.7 versus 118 would be the PHP version. You can stick with a minimum version of 5.5 for 117, but you need to be on 5.6 or above for 118. So some of the things that you... Uh, could see that have changed uh, with Simple SAML 118. Um, they've done more work on, on completely new admin and user interfaces, uh, including work to make it easy to disable the admin interface if you really don't want that out there for your Simple SAML setup. Uh, there are some new options for uh, setting uh, assertion consumer service and some other information about SPs that you are integrating. There is um, potentially uh, issue of a change that you may have to work around. This may be another reason for holding off on 118. They've changed, uh, they're deprecating the use of built-in memcache and PHP for memcache D. Um, and to, uh, there's, there's good information out there in the change log about what you need to do but that's another change uh, that may slow you down if you're relying on memcache. And again, you may want to stick with 117.7 and, uh, and then work on getting to 118 if, if you're not concerned. If you, if you uh, it, it, there's an easy workaround to the disclosure information uh, if, you, if you aren't concerned with making the user interface available in the first place. The, um, Change log uh, is highlighted there. You could go take a look to see what's been changing with these versions. And then the other thing I'll note is that uh, according to the release plan, there's, there's still plans for a 119 release while they've continued work on 2X. So uh, both of those uh, versions are in the works. All right, thanks, Mike. Uh, I'd like to introduce Paul, who's gonna talk to us about this point. Hello everyone, my name is Paul Spouty and I'm here to talk about Midpoint. Midpoint is relatively newer for us. Um, it's an identity management and governance platform. Uh, what does that all mean? That means it allows you to handle identities and provisioning and deprovisioning and all that good stuff. Uh, the current latest version is 4.0.1. This is a long-term support uh, edition for OIS and it has Java 11 support. So you get Java 11, it also has Java 8 support. Well, that, that, that may be deprecated in the future, but, uh, Jeff, but both for right now. In development is 4.1, um, and there is no timeline on that one. So what's new in 4.0? Um, under the hood, lots of stuff under the hood. UI, um, security, all that good stuff. Some big features like archetypes, um, they're basically like the old subtypes. 
Uh, what they allow you to do is hang objects off of each other. So you have users. I could have an employee user or an administrator user um, and hang off of there. It's a basically an abstract role um, and allows you to derive assignments and things from that um, in, in an innovative way. Um, they have improved several of the connectors. So you have LDAP, AD, database, um, scripted SQLs in progress, and CSV have all been improved uh, connectors uh, to better work with 4.0 and some of the newer things coming down the pipe. Um, and then uh, under there's expression profiles. So um, expression profiles, what they allow you to do is um, limit what expressions or in midpoints words expressions mean scripting. So it limits what your scripts can do. So an administrator can go in and say that only for this area or these things, only these types of things are allowed to do in a script um, for security reasons. Because in a script, you can do quite a bit in midpoint under the hood. And then there's also thresholds. Thresholds was experimental in 3X and, and still kind of is in 4X. But what that allows you to do is say, when there's a change made, so let's say someone accidentally deletes a bunch of rows in CSV connect, you know, for the connector, or someone goes into the HR system and makes a mistake, and all of your users get deleted. Well, what happens if there's automated provisioning is that Midpoint will take that change, right, and delete all your users. Now your users can't log into Office 365, or they can't get into any of their accounts, right? So what the threshold allows you to do is set a threshold, and if it goes over that, Midpoint will stop and not make the change, and notify people about it, whoever you've set up. And so you can set those almost everywhere in midpoint. Um, you can turn them off as well. Um, so that's one of the nice things about that. So that really big changes or big errors do not mess up your whole provisioning environment. And then finally, a, a really nice feature, if you've been following 3 and 4X, is that they have, um, like I said, objects off of other objects. So you have kind, intent, and things like that of what you want this object to do. So, for example, I have an organization. Well, I want it to be a department in a college. Well, I can specify that it's a kind as a department and the intent is a department. So what this allows you to do with this resource multiple account handling is that resources now used to have to have separate resources to bring in like organizations, for example, people, for example. And what happens if that's all going back to your SIS, which has all that same data? You just have to have separate resources. And that might be a, still a good choice. But uh, Midpoint 4.0 has the ability now to use a, a, in, inside of the resource connector to pull back multiple different types of objects separated by, separated by that kind and intent. And that's just a brief highlight of, of all the good features in, in Midpoint. Um, if you want to know more, there's lots more features I haven't even touched on. Um, it's all in the Evolvium Wiki. Wonderful. Thanks, Paul. All right, really quickly before we take questions, we just wanted to mention two clients specifically. So Internet2 actually has worked with Unicon um, to build out the Shibboleth IDP UI. So take something that's very, very technical. And actually over the last approximately two years we've been working on this uh, with releases out in the community available for you to pick up and try. Uh, most recently we've been working on accessibility. So we're kind of putting the I guess icing on the cake, if you will. Um, we anticipate this release will be ready for everybody to try out the first week of December, give or take. Watch for the updates to come, and we'd love your feedback on that. Secondly, Accepto is one of our recent customers. Uh, we've been able to, with their help and their desire, be able to integrate the MFA with CAS. So now there's another option for people to select when they're looking for multi-factor authentication and using CAS. All right, so why don't we go ahead and shift to questions. Uh, with that, I'm going to introduce Eric Golden, one of our senior PMs. He's going to read through the questions, and then we'll get you some responses. So, uh, so far we only got one question. That's from uh, John Gasper, and he asked if the current version of the SHIB CAS Off M3 is compatible with the current SHIB IDP release. And um, Dima had answered that, but we also answered that in the slide, that it, it is indeed. Wonderful. So that is all we have. All right. So I did want to make one note. I know that um, JJ was talking about the group of deployment guide. He was, in fact, correct. So we have been making great strides, specifically working with uh, Bill Thompson and others at Unicon here, as well as all of the feedback that's come from the community. Um, and there are several, I guess, 
tons and tons of feedback. So what we're doing is we are targeting the next release of the Grouper Deployment Guide or version two to be week one, December, which is actually the week prior to Tech Exchange. So that will be out in the wiki for all to use. Um, hopefully we will be able to then take the long-term updates, which were the bigger changes, and move those in to the guide come January, February. Are there any additional questions that anybody has? We'll give it a minute in case anybody has anything they'd like to add to the chat window. Hey, hey, Sharice, who all from Unicode yeah. is going to be at Tech Exchange this year? Uh, let's see. Mike Grady is going to be there. I'm going to be there. Jillian Fenton, one of our um, sales account managers, will be there. I believe that's it. I think there's the three of us. Okay, excellent. So I'd just like to encourage any of you all that are on this briefing or watching to go meet someone from Unicon, shake a hand. Excellent. Thanks, JJ. Good comment. So we got a, uh, another question uh, from Christy Wall, uh, UGA. Um, do you expect to perform income and federation testing on normal CAS upgrades and patches? I can try to address that question. So the CAS community itself will not test against Incommon, right? They're going to test their product being a SAML2 provider in the best possible way that they can. Um, now, that being said, that should make Incommon just work, right? Incommon is no different than any other SAML2. Um, CAS just has to load the metadata, whether by the query protocol or by the aggregate file, and then it, it can, you can use those SPs as is. Um, I am not aware of many bugs with Incommon. Um, in the last few months, I've integrated several clients with it, and I have no problems. But um, if there are, is there, if there is anything, uh, please open a support ticket, and we'd like to be able to look, take a look at it, and um, assist you there. Thank you, Paul. Or, or if okay. there's something in particular that your concern is unique about, that you think is unique about it, that. Um, you think needs to be tested? I mean, we're, we're certainly certainly open to ideas and suggestions to uh, to pass on to the to the community. Thanks, Mike. Anybody else have anything? All right. Well, while you're thinking about that, I did want to make one more introduction. Behind the scenes, helping us through this webinar as well is Steve Erickson. He's actually one of our senior business analysts, and he's been very involved in the IEM team as a whole. So you will actually see his name as well as Eric Goldman's name if you haven't already this year, definitely into 2020 when it comes to talking about support. They're going to be moving in and taking um, really a lot of, making a lot of movements and a lot of progress with our open source support sustaining engineering and assisting with, assisting with support all around. So watch to hear from them soon. All right, let's see. Any final questions, Eric? Nope. Okay. A couple other things I could add Sharice on the SHIB side as a uh, FYI, we, we've been, we're, we're looking at, we just don't know when it will, would result in anything that we can make available to you. We've been looking at several areas for the SHIB IDP uh, for sustaining engineering, one of those being to add some password reset capability to the SHIB IDP, uh, similar to what the CAS server has. And the other area was just to uh, make it a little easier for people to do reporting from the logs in terms of the activity that their IDP was getting. So just want you to be aware that those are things that we've been kind of doing in the background at a low level. And eventually we hope to be telling you a lot more about uh, in the future. Thanks, bye. All right, the Unicon team, is there anybody else that would like to contribute anything further before we wrap up today? All right, well, I want to thank you all for your time and participation in today's open source support IAM briefing. We will post this webinar alongside a blog on our website, allowing you to reference the session in detail, as well as to possibly send it to others if they were not able to attend today. Thank you all very much and have a great day.